Thanks for coming today. It's actually a great honor to come here and talk to you because I'm a big fan of the stuff that goes on here, of uh, the research you guys do. And so it's, uh, it's very nice to come and talk to you. I'm going to talk about, as Amin said, a, a project that we've been working on actually since I started at Yahoo three years ago. It takes that long to build real systems sometimes. And, um, and it's a very interesting project because even though it's a research project and I'm going to talk about some of the research aspects and, and kind of highlight those. It's actually a production system. It runs with many applications in Yahoo's data centers. And, and, and a lot of the research that we've done has been driven by the things that have happened in, in the real production system. You know, research problems we wouldn't have necessarily imagined, but you know, you put it into production, you get 100 million users trying to use it, and suddenly uh, you know, you got to deal with a bottleneck or a new uh, research issue that you can deal with. So, and, uh, you know, it's a collaboration between research, which is where I work, and then an engineering group called Yahoo Cloud Computing. And I'll talk a little bit about the cloud as part of this talk. So here's the general overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about cloud services in general at Yahoo. I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about how Peanuts works, some of the advanced features by which I mean researchy things which are going to go into production but haven't necessarily gone into yet, and then a little bit on lessons learned. So just. Uh, just a one slide overview of Yahoo. I mean, hopefully you've all heard of us, um, but uh, you may not know exactly everything that we do. So Yahoo is actually a collection of a lot of different applications, which we call properties. So you can think of mail as a property, messenger, finance, sports, shopping. All these things are, you know, quote unquote properties. These are revenue centers, right? 19 of our properties are number one or number two in terms of the total number of uh, people that go to it. We are number one total time spent online, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, you know, we're a big website, as you know. The thing that's interesting to me is just the sheer number of people that we get. Okay, so every month, we get 158 million unique US visitors and 605 million unique worldwide visitors. Okay, this is a huge amount of users. And they don't just come and, and then look at one page and leave. They're coming to Yahoo. They spend a lot of time on our sites. They go you know, check their stock. They check their auto prices. And, this presents enormous scalability challenges. Making all these people happy is, is a huge problem. And we have to make them happy because this is where we make our money, okay? If users come to Yahoo sites and look at our display ads, click on our search text ads, okay, we get revenue. So we need to keep them happy and that means, from my perspective, high performance. Now I'm gonna focus on this talk and in my work in general on the, what we call the audience side of Yahoo. You can think of Yahoo roughly as two uh, parts. The search side, the search engine, making the search queries go fast, and then the audience side, which is mail, messenger, finance, all the things where you're not searching necessarily, but you're using some property. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about our efforts in cloud computing, of which uh, uh, Peanuts is a big, uh, major part of that. So why did we move towards the cloud computing model? You know, we have infrastructure, it works fairly well, we've had it for a while. Well, there were two things that we identified as, as things that we wanted to do better. The first was we wanted to be able to build new applications more quickly. You know, if you build an application in Yahoo, it's possible that 100 million people will look at it on the first day. And if it's slow or if it crashes, then they won't look at it on the second day, right? So everything we build has to be at web scale. And that means if you're going to build a new application, you spend typically a lot of time, six months or a year, just architecting the database back in, much less figuring out what color the page should be and whether this feature or that feature, right? So if we have a cloud where people can just use the infrastructure without having to rebuild it each time, then we should be able to build better things faster. And the second thing is that we want to be able to increase availability. So whenever there's downtime, even for something that had been up for a while, downtime is bad. We lose revenue. And you know, so far the solution to avoiding downtime is having lots and lots of redundant servers and lots and lots of redundant system operators. Right? So if we can reduce that cost somewhat, we can actually have a higher availability without spending quite as much money. And the idea is that cloud services will centralize into a central cloud organization the heavy lifting of scaling and high availability and sort of get an expert group that knows how to keep the system up and keep it scaled. And then the rest of the business can focus on building their property, building their application. Okay? And we're going to focus on what we call horizontal cloud services. So database as a cloud, not necessarily mail as a cloud, which you might think of as a vertical service. Okay. So as we started building the cloud, we realized that there's many different requirements. These are sort of the main ones. The first is it has to be multi-tenant. And by that we mean many different applications with different requirements, different performance characteristics running on the same hardware. Okay. It's not really a cloud if every application has their own dedicated cluster. You want them to share resources as much as possible. Also, we need horizontal scaling okay, and elasticity. So the difference between these is scaling means I can make it big 
right? And elasticity means I can make it bigger when I need to, okay? So not only does it have to be big by, I just buy a bunch of servers, but if it turns out that a property needs more capacity, maybe 10% more capacity, I should be able to just plug in 10% more servers, maybe with a turnaround time of an hour or 10 minutes if I could, right? And give them that extra capacity. Right now it's a three to six month provisioning process of ordering the servers and plugging them in and shifting the data around. So let's make it much more efficient. Of course, once it's in a cloud, you need security, you need account management. Obviously, Yahoo needs to protect the security and privacy of its users. But now if I've got two different applications running on the same hardware, we need to sometimes protect them from each other. And finally, obviously, it needs to be highly available and highly operable. So every cloud service we build needs to sort of satisfy these characteristics before we allow it to be part of the cloud. If I look at the cloud that we're building, and I look just at the bottom layer, which is the database layer, there are other things in the cloud, which I won't get into, like caching and messaging and so on. But just at the bottom database layer, there's roughly, roughly three kinds of database systems that we need. And I think of Hadoop as a database system because I'm a database guy. Right? So the first is Hadoop, which is primarily focused on compute workloads. And when we look at how they access data, it's scan-oriented. And the primary thing that we're trying to optimize here is the amount of money we have to pay per CPU cycle. So what's the most computation I can squeeze out of a million dollars worth of hardware, for example? In contrast to that, peanuts, which is the thing that we're working on, is much more organized around structured data storage, reading and writing individual records with something that looks like a random I.O. workload instead of a sequential I.O. workload. And the main thing that we care about here is latency. So what's the smallest amount of latency I can get for a million dollars worth of hardware? And the third uh, kind of system is what we call blob storage. The specific system we've built, I haven't built it, another group built it, was called mob store for massive object store. And this is really all about unstructured objects. So if I want to retrieve an email attachment or a photo or an audio file, I don't need a database style query and I don't need a Hadoop MapReduce job. I just need to get the cheapest storage for a large number of gigabytes that I can. Okay? All these things are important because an application, a property in Yahoo is going to use all of them. All right? Uh, when you build it, you're not going to say, oh, all I have is structured storage. I never need to analyze my data, or I never need to show photos. Applications use all of these things. So they're all in the cloud, and they're all working together. And what we found is that as we started building these cloud databases, we found that we were the DBA to the world. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, when you have a database system, typically you hire somebody for a lot of money every year to sit and tune your database for your particular application. Well, now we're doing that job for all the applications at Yahoo. And we can't hire enough DBAs to do that. So we need the system to auto-manage itself as much as possible, do automatic load balancing, automatically heal itself when there's a failure, and that kind of thing. Now, there's still humans in the loop, obviously, but the more things we can automate, the better. And we have to make it massively scalable. Okay, so a particular application may require 100 servers, but now we're running, hopefully, all the applications, so we may need 10 times as many servers all working together. Okay? So we can't buy expensive servers. We have to buy commodity servers. When they die, we just throw them away and get new ones. Right? And we have to assume that failures are the common case. We can't say, well, failures are rare. Failures are something that we assume is going to happen every day. In fact, it, in a system the size of Peanuts, we get in this current deployment, we probably will get about one server failure every one or two weeks. And a hard server failure, meaning the thing doesn't come back, at least once a month. And as we scale up, we're going to get even more failures. Okay? And you have to bake these capabilities in from the start. You can't glue on you know, fault tolerance to a system after it's been in production. You have to think about them from the beginning. So that is sort of the background of what we're trying to do with cloud services in general. And Peanuts is a system, as I mentioned, for structured data that we've built into this paradigm. So let me tell you a little bit about exactly how it works. So to motivate this architecture, let's take one example of an application that we run on Peanuts. There are others, many others that we run, but just, just to give you one idea. So imagine you've got a social network. I hear they're all the rage these days, right? So, so Yahoo is building one of their own in addition to Facebook and Twitter and all those other guys. Imagine that you've got a social network, so there's some user, Brian, and he's got a bunch of friends, and his friends do things, right? So his friend posts a photo to Flickr, another friend posts a restaurant a review to Yahoo Local. And when I log in, I want to see what my friends are up to, right? Just like when you log into Facebook, you see the news feed. Uh, right now, if you log into the new version of Yahoo Messenger, you'll actually see what your, friends are, your messenger friends are doing real soon now. When you log into front page of Yahoo, that's www.yahoo.com, you'll see what your friends are doing throughout the rest of the network. So how would we build this kind of application? Well, one way you could build it, and this is pretty close to how we actually did it, is whenever a user does something, like posts a photo or does some event, 
we push that event into the database. And so you see the database in the middle now, and there's one record per user, and every time there is an event, we're appending that event to the user's record. And we actually keep like a, a circular buffer, so maybe we keep the last 10 events for that user. And then when Brian logs in, we have to figure out who his friends are, look up all those friends, collate the events that they have recently done, and then produce the result page, okay? So you can see already, with the number of users that we have, hundreds of millions, this database table in the middle is going to be quite large, and also people are doing things quite a lot. So there's going to be lots and lots of events every day. So I have to support a very high write rate of things coming in on the left, and of course people log in all day long, so we need to support a very high read rate on the right. So this kind of database has to be scalable, but it doesn't have to have a lot of the things that you would traditionally build into a relational database. It doesn't have to have particularly complex queries, right? All I'm doing is find my friends, look them up. I'm not doing complex aggregations. I'm not doing, you know, joins of 10 tables. I'm not doing complicated uh, queries. In fact, in Yahoo, if you want to do these complicated queries, you do them in Hadoop. You don't do them in our production databases. And we don't need strong transactions, right? So if Sonia posts a photo and it doesn't appear right away to me, it's not a huge issue, right? So it's possible for me to be a little bit lazy about consistency if it gives me better scalability. So I can trade away some features of a traditional system to get better scalability, flexibility, and availability. And that's what we've done in Peanuts. We've we set out a set of design principles to support these kinds of systems. So first of all, it's record-oriented. Second of all, it's scale-out, which means that everything we do, every tier of the system, has to be scalable by adding more servers, okay? I, have, I should be able to run this on a, you know, a cluster of really cheap machines, you know, 386s if you guys remember those, probably not 386s, but really cheap machines if, if that's what I want to do. And it has to be uh, at low latency, so every expensive operation has to be asynchronous. Anything that I'm going to do that's going to take more than 10, 20, 30 milliseconds, I'm going to try and do it asynchronously if I can, okay, so that my users are not waiting for me to do something, some expensive complicated transaction in the background. The consistency model has to be uh, something more than just I'll do my best effort because once you have asynchrony, data is flying around in the background and when I look at a piece of data, it may or may not be up to date. So there has to be some consistency model which allows the developer to understand what their data is when they're looking at it. We want to have flexible access so that you can access things according to different uh, access patterns, hashed or ordered and so on and so forth. And of course, it has to be a cloud. So given these requirements, here's the system that we built. So the main part of the system, the, the bulk of the servers are what we call storage units. So these are just commodity boxes. They run commodity software plus our code, right? So it's Apache is the web server, it's MySQL as the storage engine, and, and whenever we need more of these storage units, we just buy them and, and, and create them. And what we do is we take data and divide it, what we call partitioning, amongst all these storage units, okay? Once the data has been scattered out amongst the storage units, we need to be able to find it again. And the way that we do that is we use a level of routers. So these are not your hardware routers that networking people think of. These are sort of software uh, reverse proxies is really what they are. And whenever a query comes in, the router knows where to send that query to find the data that it needs. There is a centralized component which is not in the data path, which is called a tablet controller, and its job is to keep track of these data partitions, where they are, move them around if necessary. Okay. And the routers really just cache a mapping of the map from the tablets to the servers and use that to do the serving. The authoritative copy of that map is on the tablet controller. Replication is handled by, yeah, question? Is there any attempt at uh, machine locality in the storage That's a very good question. So I have a little bit of slides, a few slides on that in a little bit later, but the, the key question is, the key answer is that yes, but you have to model your data in a certain way. You have to tell us what data is related and then uh, a, there's a version which will uh, cluster that related data on the same server so that I can do just a short range query to pick it all up. And you're talk about what, how you specify that yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's nothing particularly, when you get there, it's, it's sort of simple. But. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's an important point, right? So you always have to sort of be careful where the data is so that you get the highest performance possible. We also want to do replication. I'll talk a lot about replication in a few slides, but the way that replication is done is that there's a set of log servers whose job it is to push updates around to different data centers. And then, of course, you've got your clients on top. Everything in Peanuts is accessible through a REST API, so people make HTTP calls. Uh, this makes it very, very easy to develop a new application. You don't have to have a client library. You just write HTTP. There's some concern about the performance of HTTP, so actually uh, there's active research, and if you guys have any ideas, we'd love to hear it, about how to optimize the transport 
of REST calls because uh, there's connection management issues. There's, uh, you know, I'm sending essentially UTF-8 or ASCII text when I could probably be compressing that, maybe uh, doing something better than actually just sending a lot, a lot of uh, unstructured data. But for the moment, it's REST. It works fairly well. It, it, it does okay. Okay. Let's look more in depth at a particular storage unit. Okay, so this, this big thing is meant to represent a disk. The partitions of the data are what we call tablets. That's a term that we stole from Google's big table. Okay, and on a particular server, there is maybe a hundred or a few hundred tablets, each of one or two gigabytes in size. Okay, as data gets inserted into the database, some of these tablets might grow, okay? And we want to keep the tablets relatively small so that they're easy to manage. So when a tablet gets too big, by which we mean over a gigabyte in size, then we split it, okay? So the splitting is done automatically by the system. The application doesn't have to worry about the data partitioning. This is done by us. Now, over time, it may be the case that this storage unit is particularly hot because it's getting a lot of requests. Maybe Tiger Woods' record is on this particular server, and so it's getting a huge number of requests, okay? The way that we deal with this is load balancing. Uh, so we shift tablets off of that server onto other cooler servers until we get the, the load back down to where we want it to be, okay? So this is the main concept in the partitioning of peanuts, is that we have a lot of little partitions, and we shuffle those partitions around for load balancing as we need to. We also shuffle them around for fault tolerance. If there is a failure of the server, there's a bunch of tablets that I need to recover. I recover each tablet to some other live server. Question? So we haven't yet had a load that was at that point, but um, we do have a mechanism for having multiple copies of a particular tablet in the same data center, and then you would just want to sort of direct the reads to both places. It's a little bit trickier to direct writes to both places, so we might send the writes to one place. Um, so far, we haven't had, um, so what happens is that if it's a particularly popular record, it's already going to be probably in the cache of the server. So at that point, we're avoiding the disk cost. And so what you need is something that's so popular that serving it out of cache on that multi-core box is not going to be fast enough. And like I said, with the applications we've had so far, we haven't hit that scenario, but the architecture should support that. Do you have a question? Uh, it's, it's extraordinarily complex. It involves uh, choosing a random number and taking the modulus of the number of tablets. So we just pick a random tablet, right, uh, today. We are working on a, a more complex load balancing algorithm that will look at the number of requests on the tablet and, and prioritize moving, you know, hot tablets to cool servers. Uh, that's a little tricky because it's not directly obvious what a hot tablet is. If I'm doing reads and writes and scans against the tablet, and some of those reads are being served out of cache, and some of those reads are being served off of disk, and some of the scans are particularly CPU intensive and others aren't. So there's no one number I can look at and say this is the hottest tablet. So we're, we're trying to develop some measure which combines all those factors and says, well, this is a good candidate tablet to move. But the basic intuition we had is that moving any tablet off of this server will help us, right? So any tablet that's taking load, as soon as I move it off, I've got less load on this server. And I just want to get this server down to the point where the latencies experienced by the clients are not too high. And then I'm basically good. So I don't have to be super optimal about it if I can avoid it. Is there a question? Yeah. Yes, we don't want to be doing this too much, right? So, so uh, I'm actually a little bit more worried about splits because um, splits... The, the tablet boundaries are synchronized across data centers. So a split, actually, I have to have multiple data centers come to some consensus on what the new split point should be. So we're extraordinarily parsimonious about our splits. We're a little bit more free with our moves because a move is just a metadata within the tablet, within the data center cares about where the tablets are. But still, you know, anytime you move a gigabyte of something across the local area network, you're going to have some congestion. And so uh, we do it whenever we need it, um, but we don't do it more than we need to. Okay, other questions? This is good, I like questions. Yeah? Uh, why a gigabyte? Why a gigabyte? Uh, so that's, uh, in our experience, it's relatively easy to move a gigabyte size thing from one server to the next within a rack without too much problem, right? <laughs> Smaller means I've got a lot more metadata to keep track of, because for each of these tablets, I have to have a mapping entry in my mapping table. And larger means there's a higher probability that I'll start to move it and I'll have to abort the transfer or, uh, you know, I'll get to the destination server and it does not have enough disk space. So a gigabyte is roughly the right amount of size for us to keep everything in check. Anything else? Okay. 
So when we do a hash table, uh, Peanut supports two different kinds of tables, hashed and ordered. When we do a hash table, we take the records and we divide them up by hashing the key. Okay, so every record has a record key. This is standard relational database stuff. Um, and the key of the record tells us, according to the hash function, which hash bucket it's going to fall into. Okay? Uh, but we wanted to make it so that we had one system for both hashed and ordered tables. So we, we use the same bucket or tablet mechanism for order tables. It's just that instead of hashing the key, we have a direct mapping. So now there's a partitioning between, you know, H, anything less than H is in one tablet, anything greater than H is in the next tablet. By, by having the same mechanism that could support both hashed and ordered, actually most of the distributed infrastructure is the same. Okay? So we, had to, we didn't have to write two different systems to support these two different kinds of data organization. The only thing that really cares is the router because it has to know whether to hash the record key or not, and the storage engine because the storage unit has to know whether to create an order table or not. But all the fault tolerance, uh, replication, query routing, all, most of that is actually the same for both kinds of tables. Here's how you would read a key, a read a record. So you go to the router. This is a REST call that the client makes to the router. It says, get me Brian's record or Tiger Wood's record. Okay, the router knows which tablet owns that key and which current server has that tablet and forwards the request onto the server. The server does a local database lookup to retrieve that key and returns it back through the router back to the client. Okay. It's a little bit more complex in the case of updates. In the case of an update, we start out the same way by sending the request to the router. The router forwards the request to the storage unit. But now the storage unit, before it does anything locally, it publishes that update to our log server. The log servers are actually implemented as a publish subscribe, topic-based publish subscribe system. Okay? And any replicas and remote regions for that tablet are subscribed to that same topic. So we publish to the log server first because we want to use the same principle the databases have used for years, which is write ahead logging. I want to write to the log first. Once it's committed to the log, I consider the transaction committed, and then I write it to my storage pool. So after the log server has written it to two redundant disks and responded, then I can write it to my local database and respond back to the, uh, to the client. Now, the response includes something called a sequence number, which I'll talk about when we get to our consistency model. It basically allows the client to do transactions. Okay. So hopefully you can see why this can be a massive scale system, because all the work is sort of one router talking to one storage unit, talking to one log server, right? And if I add more of any of these colors of boxes, I should be able to support more requests at the same time. Now, if the requests themselves get more heavyweight, right, if, it, if each individual request does more work, then I may have a bit of an issue. But because my scalability issue is primarily the number of requests, not the cost of an individual request. It's very easy to scale out by just partitioning the requests among servers. Yeah? Can you share any um, numbers with respect to the ratios of the various colored boxes that you have been in? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, I would say that the blue boxes, the storage units, right now are in the hundreds. We want to get them up into the thousands. Um, the routers aren't doing a lot of work. They're primarily just big CPU you know, shelves. And so they we probably have a factor of 10 less uh, routers. Uh, the routers. The current router we're using can support something like 10 or 12,000 requests per second, whereas a storage unit, um, primarily because it's using MySQL on disk, can support something on the order of 1,000 or 1,500 requests per second. Uh, the log servers are primarily doing writes, but they're all doing sequential writes. So um, whereas a storage unit has the support of a lot of disk seeks, this, the log servers can make do with uh, less servers because most of it's sequential. Uh, the log servers were actually transitioning technologies there, but uh, in the old days it was probably three to one, uh, three times as many storage units as, as log servers. Question? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. So the main thing is that we want to have lots of RAM for two different purposes. In the routers, I want to have a very large tablet map that I can look up very quickly so that I can support very large tables. In the storage unit, I want to have a very large data cache. Okay? So it just turned out to be, from a provisioning standpoint, cheaper to buy two different boxes. And, and, and this box, the pink box, doesn't have a lot of disk. It has a very large multi-core CPU, maybe eight core or more if we can get them. Whereas the storage unit has, you know, sort of a lot of RAID disks and as much memory as we can put for the, for the cache. Now, there's nothing inherent about the technology that prevents us from putting the pink boxes on the blue boxes. I mean, it's just two different processes. We could run them both. But in our production experience, it's easier. And it's also a little bit easier to manage from the monitoring standpoint. If this box is, is overloaded, 
you know, it's a blue box. We know that it's because of the of the data access. If it's a pink box, we know it's probably is, uh, because of the routing. Question? Did you say the, you use Microsoft Yes. Yeah. So it's so it's Apache with an Apache plugin that does our specific logic, and then MySQL with NoDB for the uh, storage engine. Yeah. Question. We really, really wanted to go with BerkeleyDB, but the lawyers told us no. <laughs> so this is right after Oracle had bought BerkeleyDB and there was some licensing issue, which I guess has been resolved now, but we're in production with MySQL. So uh, we may move to BerkeleyDB or something lighter weight. We're actually not using a lot of MySQL, right? We're not doing a lot of the query planning. We're very barely using the transactions. There's a lot of stuff in MySQL that I would avoid because it adds latency if I could. And we will get there. We actually had an intern last summer uh, working with us on an alternative storage engine to MySQL, and that may get into production at some point soon. But this, you know, this is this is a has to work in production kind of thing. And we, we looked at all the things we had to build, and if we didn't have to build the file system, then that saved us a year's worth of effort. So we went with MySQL. Yeah, but I, we're not probably gonna be there forever. Yeah, question. So I want my reads to re, to respond in 10 milliseconds or less. Uh, our 99th percentile is probably 25 milliseconds. Um, for writes, it's a little bit more. Obviously, you're touching, you're touching disk multiple times. You're going to multiple servers. Our SLA is 99th percentile uh, of 100 milliseconds, but we observe probably 50, 60 milliseconds in practice, which is good. You know, we can't do much more than 100 because uh, you, know, you want your page to load in less than a second. They've sh done studies that if your page takes longer than a second to load, then you're going you're gonna to become frustrated, even though what's the difference between one second and two seconds? I mean, you can't really tell, but people psychologically observe that. And we're just at the bottom of the stack. There's application servers and HTTP servers, and there's all sorts of stuff above us. So the budget that we get for a write is really 100 milliseconds or less. Yeah, question? So that's a good question. I'll get to that. I got a whole bunch of slides on that. That's an excellent question. All right, good. I'm glad you guys are, are into this. So just one other point is that we use log servers as a separate dedicated server because it makes our storage units disposable. So if a storage unit fails, the data has already been replicated to other places as a redo log in the log server. I can just, you know, if the storage unit doesn't come back, I don't have to, you know, freak out. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about consistency after your question. Yeah. Is the only backup in the log server? No. Let me talk about that right this moment. So that's a, so we, remember I said we have to um, deal with failures as a first class object. So. From the very beginning, we focus on replication. But as I mentioned, any expensive operation has to be asynchronous. Replication, especially replication from one data center to the next, you know, that's 10, 20, 50, 100 milliseconds. If I'm going to Singapore, it could be two, 300 milliseconds. So I, I made that asynchronous. So here's what we did. So imagine that there's a user, and she's updating her profile. She does an update to her local data center, OK? We'll respond directly to the application, and she'll get a confirmation after it's been written to the storage unit and the log servers. Later in the background, we'll propagate those updates to other data centers. Okay? Now, we do that for two reasons. We do it first because she might have a friend on the East Coast that wants to see her updates, and we would prefer that he had a low latency read, so he could read from a local data center instead of having to go to the West Coast to see her uh, updates. And the second thing is, you know, when the big one hits and uh, California breaks off into the sea, and you'll see that's my house there in the black part on the, on the ocean front. Um, if we have a major data center outage, we want the data to be replicated to some other place. This is what we call business continuity plan. Every property at Yahoo has to have a business continuity plan so that when there is a data center outage, which doesn't always happen because of actually something catastrophic like this, but more often because a construction crew has cut the cable, you know, fiber optic cable that goes to the data center, or because there's a power outage, we, you know, Yahoo can't go down because some guy cuts a power cable, right? So, so there has to be uh, business continuity. So how do we do this asynchronous replication? I just want to point out also that my last slide had a pretty picture of the US, but we're really worldwide, OK? All right, so th the way that we cope with this is we give application developers a consistency model. We started out with this model, which is what we call the timeline consistency model. A record goes through a sequence of updates, and all copies of the record experience the same sequence of those updates in the same order, OK? We also support an eventual consistency model. This is a newer feature. I'll talk about this a little bit. Um, there's some anomalies, which I'll talk about in the next, uh, in, in a few slides, why you might choose one versus the other. Um, but the timeline model gives you a nice way of dealing with the fact that you're dealing with asynchronous replication. So there's always, for a given record, a current version. But other data centers that don't have the current vision, version might have some stale version. When I'm an application and I do a read, sometimes I'm okay with the stale version. You know, I'm reading your profile record. 
It's not the most up-to-date thing, but I'd rather get that in 10 milliseconds than to go across the country and spend 100 milliseconds. So I'll use the local copy. From time to time, though, it's very important to get the most recent copy. And then we have a, a call, a flag to the read call, which allows you to say, give me the most up-to-date version, even if I have to go to some other place to find it. And then there's an intermediate uh, level, which is, I've got a version that I've seen previously. The next version I see should be at least as new as that. Okay? So maybe I've shown you a page. I don't want that page to go back forward and forward in time every time you do a reload. So the last thing you saw was version 6. I have to show you something version 6 or maybe newer. Okay, it's what we call a critical read. When I do an update, I always update the head version, the most current version. I can just do what we call a blind write, which is just write that record and who cares uh, what was there already. Or if I want something that looks like a database transaction, I can say, well, I know that the last version of this record that I read was version 7. Here's an update, but apply this update if and only if the record is still at version 7. If some other client has come in and updated the record to version 8, reject my write with a special error code saying test and set error, and then I'll know that there was a intervening update. I need to go reread the record again. So this is actually, if you know your database, it's just optimistic concurrency control. I, I most of the time assume that there's not going to be a conflict, but when there is a conflict, I detect it, and then I restart my transaction. Okay. So I mentioned that this is one consistency level that we support. We also support eventual consistency as a more traditional in the sense that there's been more papers written about it. Uh, model Dynamo at Amazon uses it. It was proposed way back in the 80s. And it works pretty well because it's extremely scalable because I just write anywhere and later I sort of figure out what happened. But sometimes it's not very easy to program against this model. And let me give you one specific example of that. Imagine you've got a user, Alice, and she does two things, okay? She, she changes her status from sleeping to awake and she changes her location from home to work. So you imagine that there's an Alice record somewhere with two fields. One of them is her status and one of them is her location. Okay, so she comes in and she changes her status from sleeping to awake, so we update that. And maybe she's done that in region one. But maybe then there's a network anomaly or there's some issue and she gets directed to the second data center for her second request, where she updates her location from home to work. Okay, so under eventual consistency, you're allowed to apply that update in the second data center, even though the second data center hasn't seen the first update. And then later, the updates propagate and everybody sees that there was some conflict and they resolve it, hopefully, to be the same value ever. So eventual consistency says, eventually, all of the copies will agree on what the final state of the data is. But there is this anomaly which, um, for a certain period of time in the second data center, there was a record whose state actually didn't, shouldn't have existed, okay? Never in Alice's mind was she sleeping at work, right? She did two things. First, she uh, woke up, and then she went to work. But if her boss, you know, is traveling and he's going to the second data center, he may look at her Facebook page and say, oh, she's sleeping at work, she's going to get fired, right? So there's, there's the possibility that unexpected states of the data could become visible under eventual consistency. Under timeline consistency, which is our other model, we avoid these particular anomalies. So again, Alice updates her status from sleeping to awake. She also updates her location from home to work. But the difference is that we redirect that update back to the original. Okay, So we don't accept that update at this, at this data center because there was something in between. Now, the only thing that's ever visible is the correct states. You know, home sleeping, home awake, work awake. The, the sleeping at work state is never visible, okay? So how do we enforce this? Well, we have a mastership protocol, and the mastership protocol is per record. So every record has its own uh, determination of where the master is. You know, Alice is on the West Coast. She does an update to her record. Her record happens to be mastered on the West Coast, which I represent using the pink bar, right? Maybe she takes a, a plane to the East Coast to visit her friend. If she does an update there, instead of accepting that update, we forward it back to the West Coast. And part of the metadata in the record is the master, the current master location of that record. Now, if she does enough updates from the East Coast, we'll realize that maybe she's moved or it's just more efficient for us to transfer that mastership to the East, okay? So mastership on a per record basis can move around to be where the updates are coming from. Now, so why would you ever use eventual consistency when it has this anomaly and timeline consistency avoids this anomaly? Well, there's a trade-off. It's just like everything, there's a trade-off, okay? So if it turns out that there's a failure and I can't write the master copy of Alice's record, for a short period, I can't write the record at all, okay? So eventual consistency allows you to always write. Timeline consistency says, I'm going to give you slightly stronger consistency, but slightly less availability. Now, after we've noticed the failure, we actually have a protocol by which we can force 
the master ship to change, what we call an override, to the East Coast, and then we can start accepting updates again. Okay? So that, that unavailability is a short window, but that window is still there. Eventually, the West Coast Data Center will come back, will propagate all the updates that we had accepted on the East Coast back to the West Coast, and then we're back to our good state again. Okay? So applications, when they create a table in peanuts, they have to specify which consistency level they want. Okay? And then that table supports that consistency level from then on out. All right. Any questions up to this point? Yeah, question. Okay, so that's a good question. So there's a lot of subtlety here, which I'll try and summarize in 30 seconds. So um, the first thing is that the West Coast, the storage unit is dead, so I don't have to tell it anything, right? Uh, but this, the West Coast log server probably is still up. So what I actually do to do the override is I publish a message into the same channel that the storage unit would have published its updates into, but it's a special control message saying, this guy is dead, all uh, future updates should go to the East Coast, okay? That message is heard by everybody, all the data centers, so they now know that the new temporary master is the East Coast, okay? And because I've published it into the same channel, it's sequenced after any update published by the dead server and before any update published by the new take take server that takes over the mastership, okay? So it remains consistent. The bigger problem we have is if we have an entire data center outage and the log server is down as well as the storage unit, and then the problem is that there may be updates from the old dead storage unit, which are trapped on that log server, which I can't force out before I transfer the mastership. And then what we do, and we do this very carefully, what we call a major override, where we force the entire data center to be BCP'd over to some other data center and accept that some of the updates may have been lost. Because that nice timeline that I was telling you was so great, once I kill the data center with a major override, there's a fork in the timeline. There's some updates which will never actually get applied. And I'm telling the application you're just going to lose the updates on that fork. So we only do that every once in a while when the data center has been down for a long time. Question? But isn't uh, the worst case where the one data center was quote unquote down is just suffering a network partition? That isn't, that isn't even worst case. Uh, uh, luckily, um, we still do have some humans in the loop. And before we do a major override, we will call the side ops at the data center and make sure we figure out, you know, either they will go in and manually shut down those servers so they stop accepting updates, or we have to. Now, I say this, we haven't actually done this in production yet. <laughs> We've tested it extensively. We think it works. If we actually have a data center outage or even worse, a network partition, we have procedures. I'll have to ask me again in a couple years whether they actually worked in practice. But, but once you start having network partitions instead of just failures, it becomes a lot trickier. And we actually, from time to time, there are network partitions within the data center where a, where a nick will die or a switch will die or something. And we have lots of sort of ad hoc ways of sort of detecting that that's a problem and, and not detecting that it's a failure because I couldn't talk to that guy, but maybe it's just partitions. So there's lots of, when you get partitions instead of failures, as you know, there's lots and lots of more complexity. Yep. Okay, we talk a little bit about quote unquote advanced features. These are features we've written papers about but haven't yet put into production. So uh, even though we support an order table abstraction, it's not quite into production yet. That's gonna go into Q1. It just takes time to QA all these things. Um, but why would you ever use an order table as a ha instead of a hash table? Well, there's certain data that naturally needs to be clustered together. So Amin pointed this out in his first question. It makes sense to cluster certain data together. So the way that we do that is that you can construct the key such that related data sorts together in the sort order, and then the order table will put them on the same tablet. Okay? So for example, I may have a time range. These are items for sale, and you know, here's the 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m. As I go down, I'm getting more and more recent. Okay? Because the lexicographic sort order of the key matches the time order, then things will be ordered according to time. But it's not just time ranges. I may have hierarchical data. So in this case, I've got like, sort of like a Craigslist style application where I've got autos and then California and then the city and then the individual item. Because I've got uh, the key constructed hierarchically like this, all the autos are clustered together, all the California things are clustered together, all the San Jose things are clustered together. So if I, want to, if I want to pick up just the San Jose autos, I do a short range scan. If I want all of California autos, I have a slightly longer range scan. Okay. Another thing that we can use order tables for is relationship graphs. So if I've got you know, 500 friends or 1,000 friends or 10,000 friends, or you know, if you look at Twitter, the top people there, Ashton Kutcher, I think it is, has like 3.8 million followers. Right? So you can't just put that all into a record because the record gets really, really wide. What you want to do is each individual connection becomes a separate record. And now to find Brian's friends, I just have to do a range scan of the records which are all clustered together and pick them all up. 
And uh, another example, and we're, we're going to use this heavily uh, starting next year, is indexes and views. And I'll talk about more about indexes, but basically if I want to pivot my data so that it's accessible by something besides the primary key, then I need an ordered table which will cluster together all the things that have the same value of the secondary attribute, and then to pick up again all the San Jose things I can do a range scan. So it turns out that there's a lot of applications that are very naturally modeled using an ordered table. Okay? So even though the hash table was the first thing we built, again, because you can only build so much per month, right, and we wanted to prioritize, uh, the ordered table, I think, is going to be uh, a very extremely useful thing for applications. The issue with ordered tables is that they don't have the nice, even load balancing properties that hash tables do. Once you hash stuff and scatter it randomly, you tend to scatter your load around. Once I start clustering things together, I also cluster my load together. Okay? So I may have the most recent data is much hotter than the older data. Okay? Everyone wants to know the latest thing for sale or the latest news story. And it's not even at the end of the range. I may have something in the middle of the range. It may be, again, that a particular sports star has a lot of queries for him, much more than the other people in the range. So I'm, I get these hot spots, and I have to cope with them in some way because, you know, again, as, as your question pointed out, if I get too much load on a single server, I'm going to have a lot of problems. The solution that we have now is, is just to be very proactive about load balancing, which means I'm going to move hot tablets from hot servers to cooler servers, and if a tablet is so hot that no matter where I move it, it creates a hot spot, I'm going to split that tablet. So another nice thing about the ability to split is that I don't have to have gigabyte-sized tablets. If a tablet is really hot, I can split it, split it, split it down to 100 megabytes or less, such that each individual tablet now can be supportable by the processing power of a single machine. The second, yeah, question? Yeah, definitely. So uh, we don't guarantee that everything within a range is on one tablet. So we have this uh, iterator model for the query. So you come and you say r range scan from foo to bar, or I guess it would be bar to foo. And uh, we'll give you some records that we can satisfy from a single tablet. But when we reach that tablet boundary, we'll return what we call a continuation object, which is actually just another query that starts up the range scan at the next tablet. Okay? So the this is, looks just like a database iterator or, you know, you know, Java has iterators. Everything has iterators, right? So, but we don't keep any client-side state about the state of the iterator. We give you back the state in this continuation object, and you pass it back to us to get more, get more, get more. And that allows us to go from tablet to tablet to tablet if the range happens to be that big. We don't expect that our applications will have a lot of very large ranges. If most of what you're doing is large scans, you should probably be using Hadoop instead of peanuts. If what you are doing are small scans that sometimes cross tablet boundaries, then we're perfect for that. Okay? All right, another advanced feature is indexes. So we want to have lots of interesting indexes so that I can access my data according to different data paths. But, you know, a traditional problem in databases is that the more indexes I have, the more expensive it is to update the data because every time I update the record, I have to go around and update a bunch of indexes as well. And it's even worse in a distributed system because I have to go potentially to other servers and update the portion of the index which happens to reside on those other servers. Okay? So again, keeping in line with our philosophy that everything expensive has to be asynchronous, indexes are updated asynchronously. Okay? Now this adds some anomalies because the index may be stale compared to the base data. And so again, we have to extend our consistency model a little bit to make it so that applications can cope with the staleness. And it turns out that once you have indexes, you can represent some interesting views. So views in databases are just sort of a materialized query the result of a query. And because peanuts doesn't have SQL, it doesn't have complex joins or aggregation or really anything other than read, write, delete, scan, right? If you want a more complicated query, one way that you can do that is to construct a materialized view and then peanuts will manage that for you and you can query that directly and get the result of your, of your computation. So let's talk a little bit about the kinds of views that we support. We think of an index as a kind of view. Imagine that I've got a base table here with a bunch of user records. Okay, and there's a key, maybe this is a, these are blog posts and this is the key of the blog post and the author and the text. And, you know, if I'm showing you just the detail page for the blog post, I need to address it by the blog post's ID. But if I want to find all of Brian's blog posts, it's not so easy to find in this table. I have to scan the whole table and pick them out. So I can create an index, right, which is, uh, you know, Brian, all of his records are clustered together by author. And then I can just do a scan here. Now we just create this as another peanuts table. Okay? There is a mechanism which is keeping this index up to date, but there isn't a separate data structure for base tables and indexes. Once we figured out how to scale tables, we put everything in tables, and now an index is just as scalable as your base table was, okay? because it's just a table. 
And once we have the indexes, we can actually create other things. You can create you know, join views, in particular equi joins, which are I'm joining two tables by setting some equality condition. So for example, maybe I've, maybe I've got the same post table as I did before, keyed by the post ID, and now I've got comments, and the comments refer to a particular post ID. Okay? This is what we call a foreign key. So typically when I'm showing you the blog's detail page, I want to show you the blog post and all the comments, which means I have to join these two tables together. I have to read the blog post out of here, and then I have to read all the comments out of here. Well, when you create a materialized join view, you can actually put them together in the same table so that Brian's post and all the comments for that post are co-located. Now, we can do this because Peanuts, like a lot of other web databases and key value stores, doesn't have a fixed schema. So I don't need to tell you in advance what the columns are. Some records have some columns, other records have other columns, and that allows me to essentially glom together objects that are structured differently into the same table. So the post table and the comments table, which had a different schema, can actually be stored together in this materialized view. Okay. So once I've got the index mechanism, I actually maintain this like an index, except for it's an index over two tables instead of an index over one. How do I maintain these? Well, the storage unit already was publishing to the log server. The log server was propagating those updates to remote regions. I'm just going to hang my view maintainer off the log server. It's going to get the same replication messages that remote copies got, even though it lives in the same data center as the storage unit. Once it gets those updates saying, oh, the base table changed. Brian changed his location from San Jose to Santa Cruz. It's going to go and generate an update, which it sends to the storage units to update uh, the, the index table. Okay? So, this is why I said most, you know, the, the penis doesn't really care about whether you're doing a, a base table or an index, because this thing is just like a special kind of application that runs on top of peanuts and gets updates from base tables and updates indexes. And now when I do my query against the index, I can just read the, Sherpa, the penis table as regular. Question? So this is, a, this is an important, interesting, and complex question. So, so every entry in the view or index corresponds to one entry in the base table for certain view types. There are other view types where this constraint does not hold, but at least for the ones I've shown you, every entry corresponds to a base table entry. So I keep the sequence number of the base table record in the view record. And now, if I ask a question like, you know, is this at least as new as version 5, I can ask that against the index as well as I can against the base table. But there's other anomalies, I don't have slides for them, but I can just tell you, that happen because of asynchronous maintenance. So you notice that an update to the uh, base table actually generated two updates. So if I change my location from San Jose to Santa Cruz, I need to delete the San Jose entry and insert the Santa Cruz entry. Okay, those are two different updates against the database. They could propagate at different speeds to remote data centers. So it may be, for example, that the insert gets there before the delete, and now I've got two Brian entries in the index, or the delete gets there before the insert, and I've got no Brian entries in the index. Right? So a lot of this is, is just customer education. We tell our customers, you can create an index, we'll maintain it for you, it's going to be extremely scalable, but it's going to be certain anomalies you have to program around. Luckily, the alternative, which is for them to build their own index, or to build it in a search engine, or to do something else, turns out to be a lot more complex than even this. So even though there are some anomalies, it turns out to be uh, easier to program against than what they have today. Yeah, question? You have, you have, a, you have a timeline for the, for the materialized view. It's just that you get these weird things where two points on that timeline may appear at the same time or no points in the timeline may appear. Right? So if, if the insert gets there first, I've got both the old index entry and the new index entry. So two points on the time. It's still a timeline, but it's just I'm seeing two states, right? Which is something you wouldn't see in the base table. Right, that's a good question. Okay, so some numbers, because we do numbers. I have lots and lots of numbers in the papers we've written. I won't bore you with more than one graph, but um, what we did is we took a bunch of, uh, you don't have to read all this. We took a bunch of, of, of machines, six machines actually. We installed peanuts, and then we also installed Cassandra, which is this open source uh, uh, key value store that started out at Facebook and now is a, an Apache project. We took HBase, which is a big table clone that runs on HDFS, and then we took a very simple sharded MySQL, okay? And we put them on the same boxes and we ran the same workloads against them because we were just interested to see how they scaled, okay? And what we measured was latency versus throughput. So I can always get more throughput by just putting more load on the system, but I'm going to experience higher latency in that case. So there's a trade-off between throughput and latency. Typically what you do is you pick the latency that you care about, that's your SLA, and you buy enough boxes that can give you the throughput you want. Okay. So here's one result. There's lots of other results I can show you later. 
This black line at the bottom here is sharded MySQL. So by the way, the x-axis is throughput. The vertical axis is latency in milliseconds. The black line is sharded MySQL. It's not doing a lot of anything, right? It's in, in particular, it's particularly inflexible. I can't reshard this very easily. So the cost I'm paying in latency for Sherpa, which is, uh, sorry, Sherpa is the internal name for peanuts. Peanuts uh, is this blue line here. I'm paying a little bit extra latency because I'm doing things like uh, consistency checks and replicating to the log server and so on. This is Cassandra. Cassandra is pretty good, but it's not as fast as us. I attribute that primarily to the maturity of the code rather than any architectural weakness of Cassandra. There's actually, um, well, for reads, they may never catch up to us because they have to sort of assemble uh, the record from multiple different mem tables on disk. But for writes, they should be very high throughput. I think um, at this point that I did this, it was sort of an older version. We're rerunning these numbers now, so we'll see how they go. The thing we were most surprised about was HBase. So <laughs> HBase, not only could, could we not get very high throughput, but we also got horrible latency. We've been working with the HBase open source community to figure out why this is. Some of this is um, because HBase is just not designed for this workload. This workload is a random workload of reading and writing individual records. HBase is designed for scan workloads, for MapReduce workloads. And although it can be used, and sometimes is used for these serving workloads, which are read a record, write a record, the whole disk structure and the whole process structure and everything is really optimized for scans. And the second thing that happened here is we wanted to use the REST server, uh, which you can use with HBase, but it's a known bottleneck. We're running, again, new experiments where we're doing directly using the Java API, and we're seeing better uh, behavior. It's still not scaling as well even as Cassandra. So these results are interesting because I, they, they sort of show that, you know, we're doing really good. Question? Uh, this is, uh, yeah, so th this hardware is, is actually not um, as good as our production hardware, so you get a little bit better in production. Uh, the other thing is that after I showed this graph to the engineering group, they freaked out. <laughs> they said, we should be almost as fast as, as sharded MySQL, and so they've actually done some um, optimization of this path. There was a lot of, we, the data format we use is JSON, which is JavaScript object notation. There was a lot of JSON parsing, which was repeated. They identified that and got rid of that. There was some lock contention. They have a different lock manager now. So. So we're doing better. But you can see even just sort of vanilla MySQL is not going to give you a huge amount of throughput for 10 milliseconds. Now, these are reads. These are uncached reads. You get better if you add more cache. There's a lot of caveats here. But, but across the six machines. Across the six machines, right, right, right. Exactly. Okay, so this is an advertisement for the project I'm currently working on, which is what I just showed you is going to be a real benchmark. We're going to release the tool into open source just as soon as I get the lawyers to sign off on it. No promises, but any days now. And, uh, and the idea would be, you know, there's a lot of these systems out there, Cassandra, HBase, Voldemort, you know, our thing, the people are building their new thing, and it would be nice if you could compare them on an even playing field. There's a lot of sort of blog post hype about each individual system with the numbers cherry-picked to show you how that system does well. Even within Yahoo, we have engineering groups saying, should I use Cassandra or should I use Peanuts? Well, you know, it would be nice to have a common benchmark to do that. So if you're interested in sort of collaborating or working with me on this, I have a tool that, that we're working on. It. What I primarily need are suggestions on interesting workloads and bindings to different databases. I've got bindings for the four that I've showed you, but if there's other databases. So you're open sourcing YCSB now too? We want to open source Peanuts as well. Uh, that's a much bigger undertaking. YCSB right now is 3,000 lines of Java code, whereas Peanuts is probably 100,000 lines of C++, PHP, and some Python, and a little bit of... No. So it's a, lot, it's a much bigger thing. The other downside of open sourcing Peanuts is that we unfortunately didn't think about open sourcing when we started it. If you're going to open source a project, it needs to start out with that mentality because you avoid a lot of external dependencies. You, you know, and so I think we will open source it. There's a commitment to doing so, but it's a matter of finding the engineering resources to identify the dependencies and either open source those or find some alternative. So pieces of peanuts, by the way, are already open source. So the router layer, we just open sourced this thing called YTS, which is Yahoo Traffic Server, which is the old ink to me traffic server. That's already in the open source. Um, we're trying to open source a messaging system that Ukarsh built uh, called Hedwig. Uh, and then at that point, the only thing really to open source would be the storage unit and the tablet controller. So we're getting there, but it's just taking time. OK, so some conclusions. So I've learned a lot of lessons. I came from academia, and I sort of got the shock of my life going to industry and realizing that everything wasn't as rosy as I thought. So first of all, simpler is way better than clever. So we had all, at the beginning, all sorts of really clever algorithms, and you know, they just don't work in practice. They're too hard to test, they're too hard to scale. Sometimes, for 10% less performance, something that has an order of magnitude less code or complexity is just way better. 
And the second thing is that it turns out that incremental is better than Big Bang. We started out saying we're going to redesign this entire database stack and then found very quickly that it was much better from a production standpoint to do things evolutionary. That's why we don't have the order tables in production yet. Not because we don't know how to do them, but because it was better to test the simpler hash table scheme and then add order tables onto it later. That's why we're using MySQL, because it was easier to start out with something and then replace it later. Also, it turns out that there's a lot of non-algorithmic challenges, right? So we, we're researchers, we think you always have to have some challenge that can be solved by an algorithm, but there's a lot of interesting research problems which are just all around, you know, solving production issues. You know, dealing with network configurations, dealing with legacy software, how do I talk to the system that has a different security model than I do, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, research that's been generated which doesn't have a nice pretty algorithm that can be proven to be, you know, order n squared. And finally, I firmly, firmly, firmly believe this, that researchers should get dirty hands. Building real systems and trying to deploy those real systems will teach you a huge amount about what works and what doesn't work, will suggest new problems. And along those lines, we do have openings. So if you want to come either for an internship or a full-time thing, you know, please talk to me. But I really think it's important to try and build something and put it out. There's a, there's a number of papers that they just prototype it, they run some prototype experiments, and it really misses, you know, the real challenges that you face in practice. All right, and uh, just as an advertisement, there's this new conference which is being uh, jointly sponsored by Sigma and SigOps. The deadline is in January. Uh, I'm tangentially involved because my boss is on, the uh, is on the steering committee. I think it's going to be a cool conference dealing with all manner of, of cloud computing issues, both on the database side and on the systems and networking side. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to look at that. And uh, there's a lot of people that worked on this, not just me, research people, but also people in the cloud computing division. Thanks, and I'd be happy to answer any more questions that we have time for.